What's up, everybody? I'm Kevin. And I'm Sergey Of the Tabletop Warlords. And today we're coming at you with a brand new segment that we are calling Under the Tabletop. That's right. The channel is evolving. And uh, we, we really want to include more content, which is, you know, uh, uh, more varied, but still all about the hobby. In that vein, this segment is going to be a video interview series where we talk to everyone in the sphere of wargaming. We're going to be talking to wargaming writers, sculptors, YouTubers, anyone you can think of that is uh, involved in the games that you love, we want to have on this segment. We are super stoked because today our first guest is going to be our good friend and one of the coordinators for Gates of Antares, Tim Bancroft. Tim is very involved in the wargaming sphere, having produced games of his own, including Hyperlight, The Serious Treaty, as well as The Quester's Guide to Duck. In addition, he is also an accomplished writer, having written fiction for many settings, including Antares itself. Welcome, Tim! Hello, Kevin and Sergey. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've just got to fiddle with my moustache a little bit here and just yes. clean down my eyebrows. I've had a bit of a problem with getting to... The uh, hairdresser recently, or a gentleman's barber, as we have near near me, <laughs> he, uh, he the lockdown happened before I could get to him, which is a bit of a problem. But um, so I'm sporting the uh, government official Boris Johnson haircut, uh, <laughs> which is only being kept in place by my ear have earphones. <laughs> well, at least it's patriotic. These things yeah. happen. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to see you guys. Lovely to see you, yeah. too, Tim. We're happy to have you on. Anyway, what can, what can we talk about? All right. Uh, so uh, our first question is about uh, is about your superhero origin story, I guess. Yes. Uh, so first things first, how did you get into wargaming in general? What was the first war game, or I guess tabletop RPG, whatever you want to answer, uh, that yeah. you fell yeah, in love cool. with that got you into the hobby? Well, when the um, meteorite first crashed down into that field, it was... <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, basically, no, what happened... Uh, as a child, um, a, I've, I've got a younger brother who's only a couple of years younger than me, and um, we didn't have much in the way of um, toys and whatever. And you know, it was really bad. We we had to share a shoebox for a bed. Um, but a bit more seriously, we ended up designing our own games. The family did all the family games and that sort of stuff, and we had to learn for, how to count up to a hundred in four different languages because. The parents insisted on doing lottery in different languages, you know, uh, bingo in four different languages or whatever it was. And so it's a bit bizarre. So we ended up designing our own games to make life interesting for us. And one of the very first games I remember designing, which was probably, I don't know, it must, must have been under 10 with first school, primary school, some between 8 and 10. We, we had some racing cars, a whole load of racing cars. We were into Formula One at the time. And uh, my brother and I developed a uh, racing car game, and um, uh, which is absolutely great. And then he said, oh, you can have the really fast car. And I thought, that's very nice. And he said, and I'll have the really manoeuvrable car that can corner great. Yes. At which point he then proceeded to design all the racing layouts, all of which had loads and loads of corners. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh... I felt a bit fiddled. <laughs> but um, seriously, so we did, so we did that for a while. And then obviously at the same time, like many people my age, I was collecting Airfix models and the Airfix uh, plastic 172nd plastic soldiers, soft, quite soft plastic soldiers. And I tried, you know, I painted them all out and tried doing a few of my own rules. Uh, and then I went to secondary school and they had a war games club. Um, so I joined the war games club. It was great fun. And that opened me up to new things. I'd already started exploring some of the metal fig figures which were around at the time, such as those from Minifigs in Southampton, which is a really big manufacturer at the time. They're still going, but they've been taken over by other people. And at the School War Games Club, I picked up all sorts of stuff. They had their own Napoleonic rules, so I, picked, so I converted all these Airfix models into a Napoleonic Russian army. So <laughs> converted the artillery, converted the Tsars, converted the cuirassiers, um, converted the infantry, and then tried to get some metal guard Cossacks, I think, from minifigs for one birthday and tried to paint them up. Um, a bit of a disaster there, but we had some fun there. And <laughs> then I also got an Ancients army and used all the Robin Hood set, the Norman set, and a number of other things. 
and the Romans, which they did. Um, and those were originally with WRG rules. Uh, and then from there, things sort of progressed. So I got some World War II skirmish rules and did that. Um, I was also at the time, I was really interested in science fiction and fantasy, but there weren't that many rules at the time. But when they came out, I picked up on them and used them. There was Reaper, I think, at the round, and Laser Burn, I think, uh, from the time. Uh, so I tried to do a few few things. Uh, but most of the rules were sort of like WRG, which later became DBM. So WRG 7th morphed into DBM. Uh, and I was involved in playtesting of DBM. I was also involved in some of the list. I contributed to some of the lists for DBM and that sort of stuff. So already my 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 breadth of wargaming um interests were massive and then round about 77 76 and 78 75 probably we found D&D and then Traveller nice. and then Broom nice. Quest um, and I really got heavily into role playing games especially Broom Quest was absolutely fantastic compared with D&D for me and for what we were interested in which was mm. a far more flexible what, um, a, what edition of, of D&D did you start off playing there? I started off in the little brown box. Do you want me to get my little brown box out? That's Hold awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. That's classically trained right there. Oh, yeah. And I will say, I, I wish America had this this neat infrastructure of wargaming subculture. Oh, that's awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And I have to ask you, Tim, what class do you favor when you play D&D? This is very important. <laughs> um, okay, well, when I, I was on the um, demo team for 4th edition, mm -hmm. um, so I demonstrated that a lot. And when I played 4th edition, up, up until the supplements started giving power creep, I mostly focused on the, the leader, the promoter type mm. thing. So the supporting, okay. the guy who goes around and tries to support everybody who or who gives somebody an extra move and sweeps them into the flank and that sort of thing. Nice. That's so cool. That's, I love that's it. Probably what, that's what I preferred in 4th edition. In in d and I can't remember. I think it was probably perhaps more to do with... I love bards more than anything else, but mm. it's this mix and match thing. It's it's funny. I had guessed so that. Funny. Before before this, I was like, Tim definitely plays a bard. I know. I love sure. really? <laughs> yeah. right. Sergey was right. Spot on. I love it. Well, that's sweet. I haven't mm -hmm. played any 5e, um, but I used to play a lot of 3.5 and and the d20 and derivatives of that as well. The mm -hmm. Conan derivative, we, we had a fantastic nice. campaign. And then Wizards also did the Star Wars d20 mm -hmm. variant, mm -hmm. or they did two actually, and really enjoyed that. But I've still got loads of West End games, Star Wars stuff, and I'm a bit of a Star Wars geek, but Star Wars geeks just regard me as a, as a someone who's just hovering you know i'm the one. <laughs> that's how i feel yeah that's how i feel when i talk to kevin i like star wars kevin yeah. knows star wars <laughs> yeah. like it beamed into my brain since i was a, a very young child <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah i know what you mean uh i beamed into my children's brains from a very young child my um we became i knew i'd done something wrong when my uh son started anticipating the droid noises on the, <laughs> 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 That's on the screen <laughs> <laughs> what? oh no <sighs> something wrong here yeah uh, but yes they're, they're really into star wars of the world which is fantastic my uh, the, which is great so yes really into that but i've also got into and written for things like Warmaster, master war Warhammer ancient battles um langton's um signal close action i was on playtesting for that as well so there's loads and loads and loads of different things my style though is what's the real for me is the real issue i prefer a much more looser much more relaxed much more narrative style of game which is mm -hmm. why antares appealed so much when i came to it it's the truth um, well it sounds like you you've really enjoyed the gambit as far yeah. as war games no and and as i said as you were searching for your D, D box like it's really cool that you grew up having that outlet 
to immediately join like social groups involved yeah, in war gaming because I would have loved that. I, yeah, I was, that does not I, exist in the U.S. No, at all. Yeah. I think I was in. I don't even know. It was almost you know later the later grades of grade school before I even knew what war gaming was. I mean, I've seen yeah. plenty of movies where the generals would move everything around with the little special paddles, but yeah. not, nothing like war gaming. So that, that's pretty cool. So Tim, it sounds like you have been involved in playing a lot of uh, war games and role playing games, but we also know that you have actually produced a few of your own role-playing games and we were curious yeah, as yeah. to what that process was like doing your first publication challenges all that good stuff uh challenges it was um it was actually good fun it was really um really interesting this the learning curve and the whole production cycle was one of the biggest issues to be honest um i originally started off on a whole bunch of fairly cheap publishing software it was actually really really high function um, but I then had to switch over into Quark, and then there's a massively steep learning curve with Quark. Uh, the, one of the more interesting things I found was actually recruiting an artist, a, a decent artist for the for the books. Um, this is for the uh, mainly for the RuneQuest, the Mongoose RuneQuest uh, books, which I happened to find an artist who was. Harsh, Scott Harshbarger, who's um, absolutely fantastic, really, really good. And he was wanting to get into write, doing stuff for all these gaming books. Um, and he, so I said, okay, well, I'm looking for this, that, and the other. And he sent me some pictures which were almost too good for the book because he was trying <laughs> to get into it. He sent me these absolutely awesome set of art and he ended up doing the cover for uh, Duck, Quester's Guide to Duck as well. Um, and in some ways, I was spoiled by him, but I was almost thinking, goodness me, this is too good. But I also struggled with um, some of the other artists. So, you know, and I think that's a lesson to me, which is that I had to use, had to be a little bit more strict with some of the illustrators and say, no, that's really not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for X and Y. And it's a case of saying, okay, well, if we don't click, then goodbye. So I was probably just tried to be because I knew how much work they put into it I was looking at doing an art degree at one time but never got mm -hmm. into it um, it never got to it if you see what I mean uh, so I was always aware of how much work they put into these pictures or concepts which they'd send me so perhaps I should have been a little bit more strict and that's something you see for example at Warlord you see Paul actually being quite strict with some of the concept artists and saying no we can't do this mustn't go with this or actually leaping on it himself and doing some stuff, which I know he did with Batu and the <laughs> and the Shemasai drone. Um, mm. So anyway, so that was um, the illustrators quite a lot. The um, main issues. What's the main issues? I think nowadays it's much easier because you've got so many options in Pod, and you've got that massive War Games Vault and RPG now, and. Um, even the Amazon platforms to set up just to print stuff off if you need it. All you've got to provide is a, is a pasted up book. Um, but for me, the first printing was a nightmare. Uh, I went with an off offset and uh, rather than a limited pod run. And the problem is the guy kept on raising the price and then tried to fob me off with some books with some oh, no. taxi gestures. He then said, oh, come down and have a look at the covers. We've already printed 2,000 of the covers, whatever it was. I went down and had a look at the covers, and uh, I said, oh, what's that huge great mark there? He said, that's not a huge great mark, that's on the original. I said, no, it isn't. And uh, there was a scratch on the plate. Oh, which no. Oh, it was a print no. in three colour. And <sighs> then the the people who'd actually produced the plates for him, they had a new person in who didn't do the separations right, <laughs> so that the you're supposed to rotate the dots when you print, and so she didn't do the rotation on the dots properly. Um, <sighs> And, and it was it was a nightmare. So I'm never going to do that again. Was, was, <laughs> that sounds <laughs> terrible. Yeah, that sounds awful. Uh, it was it was. <sighs> I'm never going to touch them again in in, uh, in my life. So mm -hmm. mm, not good. But now, of course, with Pod, you don't have so many of the issues, and all of that's done for you because all you're going to do is provide the um, PDF, which was PDF X1A. But I don't know what the current standard is. Um, but luckily, I don't have to worry about that because that's all done by the. Um, graphics guys in the wall of studio at the moment that sounds a lot but, better you know, uh, yeah, yeah. i would go with that having done, <laughs> having done it it's it's i could pick it up you know fairly straightforwardly again now and, and that's so cool mm -hmm. decent decent software <laughs> um 
dangers, blah, you can spend too much time in the layout. And potential pitfall, proofing. Proofing. Mm. Um, you can never do enough proofing. Um, I've worked uh, as a printer and in printers and all the rest of it and done proofing. And whilst at the end of the day, it's what the customer wants. If the customer says, no, that's exactly what we wanted. Um, proofreading is very different to copy editing or line editing or um, you know series editing, that sort of stuff. Uh, I actually quite enjoy proofreading, um, but you often don't pick up the story or what it is you're going to do at mm-hmm. the time. Um, but I actually really enjoy editing the stories and the stuff, material that comes into Warlord Games on the Antares line. Uh, the main issue, of course, it is really, really time-consuming, um, which, from my perspective, is probably why you shouldn't ask a successful writer to read through read through anything you've just done. They are way <laughs> too busy, and they know that it actually costs a lot to get a decent uh, editor, mm-hmm. um, or even indies. No, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> what kind Oops. of stories have you been writing, Tim? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I went. I went to one. Uh, I went to one. Um, one uh, workshop which was on uh, reading. Uh, I how to read your stuff. And mm-hmm. I used to be a voice coach. And I thought, well, I better go. For, I've got my own ideas, and I've mentioned it to people. So I better go to this just to make sure to see how this person does it. And one of the other attendees, um, and everybody was saying, oh, what have you done? What have you published? And I said, well, I've published. And they thought, oh, it's very strange, you know, all gaming, whatever, all gaming and role playing and that sort of stuff. And uh, a few stories and one a few competitions that sort of stuff and one of the others says yes i'm writing my story now and trying to read it and i'm trying to read it for our local group and this guy next to me said yeah i i uh i write porn <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah I, I, in fact he says I, I write gay porn which which is why i want to come onto this and uh, he says it's something my wife still struggles to come to terms with <laughs> <laughs> but he then actually explained why, which is absolutely fantastic, which is that he felt that he could actually get into the mind of a man who was actually falling in love much better, or who was having sex much better than he could imagine um, going into a, a woman. And which that is makes a lot of sense. Artistically, it makes a lot of sense and exactly really quite... Um, it shows a massive amount of integrity. So uh, yeah. got on board with him. He's a fantastic guy. Um, what are the pitfalls? Uh, it's something you've got to be careful of, I think, is... Um, too many free copies. I think nowadays reviewers expect all sorts of free copies. But the trouble is, is that once you've got distributor profits, retailer profits, and all the rest of it, um, you've got to sell a lot to make up for a free gift. And very often, mm. you don't get that return um, from reviewers. And for smaller scale publishers, it can really kill and make a big dent in profits. Uh, of which there are a few at the, at the lower end, I have to say. It's, it's not something you go into if you want to be rich. It's something you go into because you love it. Mm-hmm. Um, I could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> so th- this is a fairly large question, um, but we know you've written a lot of fluff for war games, and we know you've written a lot of really awesome fiction for Beyond the Gates of Antares and for other systems. Um, what to you makes a strong piece of world building fiction and what how do you choose the stories that you wish to tell in order to expand the universe yeah that really is a big question a, a combination of questions i have to yes. say yeah you're quite right. <laughs> um it's one that we took some time going over in my masters and several several weeks in fact there was a whole it was one of the focuses of uh one of the courses and obviously I also did some science fiction uh, studied that as well uh, but one of the key things and let's take exam- examples uh, for stuff I choose to write it's a case of what has to be written in other words is for a new supplement or character and then I just generate ideas around that um, of, and for me I'm lucky I suppose ideas are ten a penny uh, but the real issue is sometimes picking the ones you like is a bit of a problem and then expanding them can be an issue. It's sort of a case of can they be expanded? Do you love the character or the situation? Uh, and what is it you're trying to explore? Um, you know, I, d- I did, did the Hook story when the Hook came out. I did the Jay Galeas introduction story for Crisaeus. And that was a case of using that interview of Jai with Batu or rather with Batu and Barre uh, to 
actually show how the Concorde was actually really scared of this situation that was cropping up and why they really needed someone with Batu's experience of dealing with hostile shards. Um, as it turned out, he probably wasn't the best person to do it because he he was a hostile shard in himself. But that's the way the story goes, and I'm really quite quite fun fun with that. But with the hook again, it was a really nice story. As in, let's let's get head to head with this Algorin and its arrogant Algorin commander, and the hook not liking it. So it's, those are stories which you had to write, and it's the same, of course, for Drone Scourge. It's something which you know there's a story you have to write and you have to develop. Um, I have to say that when you come on to what makes it a strong piece or what really makes it important is really if you find yourself becoming really immersed and embedded in the writer's fugue as you're writing it, then it's probably a good time. By writer's fugue, I mean that sort of like trance-like state where you build up that story all around you and you're actually writing and describing what it is you see and envision in your mind and where sometimes characters start taking over and saying things in personality which you didn't expect, which is also a good good sign as well, I think. I'll come on to expanding the universe and writing in the universe in a minute. But the main thing is to just get up and write, practice. If you can, if you can write um, 500 words a day, 1,000 words, even a couple of hundred that makes mm-hmm. sense. As long as you keep writing, it really helps. There's this repetition thing, you know, it's 20,000 hours, is it 10,000 hours, 20,000 hours, I can't remember, before you become good at something. And it actually lands for writing as well, um, which means stuff like, from a professional perspective, writer's block is not something you can afford to have. I mean, I think it's a bit of a myth anyway, because for me, it probably means you've committed yourself, uh, or you've not committed yourself, I should say, or you need to look at a different angle, or reread or research something um, because you're not embedded in that story and it doesn't fluff out um, as much as you expect. And, and it could actually mean that it's something else. It, it could be that you mind out the narrative you're trying to tell. So that's it. That's the story. Um, in which case you have to think, start thinking about a different, different ending. So maybe you need a different twist or a different story for the length you're writing. But that's, that's the thing. That's what happened in this competition recently in that one of the key things was, can people write the length of story we ask? Because when you're writing for something like a, a wargaming book, we want 500 words, because there is a column space which is 500 yep. words. <laughs> yeah. no more. Um, I, I, I mean, it was tough. I mean, having been someone who participated, it was difficult because... I don't know. It's like once you read through it, like you just it was it was interesting to see how much stuff was really the fat that you could cut. Like yeah. you know, you'd have like a little yeah. sentence, and you're like, I don't, I don't need this, I don't need this, and like, and it's yeah. a, that redactive process that was uh, fun, but difficult. Yeah, it can be very difficult, but that's probably the best way. One of the really good ways I find one of the way, and everybody's got their own process. I have to stress this. I found one of the great ways to approach a story of a fixed length is just to write, is to work out the ideas, write it. And then very often, if you get really interested, you'll find you're writing 5,000 words when you're actually only looking for two. <laughs> so, yeah. and, uh, but the point is, having got to that 5,000, you can then chomp, chomp out. Um, sometimes it's difficult and it can be quite a, diff- quite a s- struggle, but that is possible. You've got the words there and you can do it and you can reshape it. And that can sometimes help you tauten up the story a little bit. For going on to expanding the universe, what's interesting is that the main rule is don't. You know, a universe like Antares is huge. It's great. It's got so much in it already. If you want to try and write a different universe, then you're not writing (laughs) Antares. Mm. (laughs) There's so much in it which um, hasn't fully been explored. So to use it. And that's, I think, one thing I'd say to anybody who's trying to write for anything like this or even write for themselves is always stay in your universe. Always respect the IP that you're writing for. Um, Immersion is really done by getting the details right, not inventing new and different ways uh, to do things because that instantly breaks the logical coherence coherency of the world you're you're trying to portray. Um, I've got a sentence here which says it's absolutely critical to keep the logical consistency going so that readers don't have to suspend too much disbelief. And that's that something makes sense. which I think goes to any of uh, anything like this. I mean, it's, it's 
it's part of writing as a professional, I think. Um, so, you know, run with it. And that applies to things you're developing as in new bits for Antares, new um, units, new um, weapons and all the rest of it. Keep the weapon within the constraints of the universe, something that's solid so that players can say to that, for example, we've, we've come up with a new plasma rifle because we've had to. Um, but it's something which players can look at. They can look at its uh, development. They can look at what it actually does and say, yeah, actually, yeah, that, that really fits. That moves on from the plasma carbine and the phase rifle. You know, it's a nice merge of the two. So uh, that's the key thing, really. And even when you're coming up with new stuff, it's a case of what is the minimum new stuff you can get away with. So for the Viri, for example, it was we've got to make these really quite different. What is the real twist we need to go? And it's sort of, well, the computers, okay. And then I had a blue screen and um, <laughs> it's sort of, okay, well, we've got to... <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we need each of these little drones to be able to be rebooted when they get into trouble. So, That's awesome. That's hilarious. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that sort of stuff. It's trying to keep it to the minimum. Now, as far as... So we've talked about your involvement with Antares already, and I want to kind of bring it back a little bit because you started off as more of a fan of the setting, uh, correct? You had the Freeborn Shard, your podcast. I was wow. a fan of the setting, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and so how did you make that transition then? Like, how did you jump from being a fan to being directly involved? Um, luck, I have to say, really. It just <laughs> happened that um, uh, I was there was a gap in Antares support and I was there, I was known as a main, as a key fan through the shard and um, it was right, right person, right time. I think it helped that I was, you know, I was the uh, podcaster. It really helped that I'd actually done gaming stuff before. It almost certainly helped that I got, you know, masters in writing and specialized in science fiction writing, it's commercial writing masters. Um, specialised in science fiction uh, as well as non-fiction um, it probably helps as well that I've won a few science fiction awards like the Orwell Society's um, Dystopian Fiction Award uh, and that sort of stuff so I, I was just right person right time as it happened to be there um, well, that was very lucky <laughs> yeah. well you've, one's got to be honest I think you, you, you think that's what it was um, I mean yes it helped that I've loved writing so as you know, I've play tested, written loads of stuff for a long time, and I've done writing various writing courses. Um, but yeah, there it was. But uh, I'd be even outside of work, I'm writing stuff, either designing designing games or writing new stories as well. So we'll see what happens. A anybody who watches our show knows that we are obsessed with Beyond the Gates of Antares. <laughs> um, we, we introduce every episode uh, saying that we're playing the best war game that there ever was. But uh, what to you makes uh, Antares stand out among war games? What makes it different and special? Probably what other people, what inspires other people as well, which was, um, if you look at, you know, Drone Scourge really started off as a fan production. It was, it was a fan Sub submitted a book to Warlord and said, look, I'll, I think this will make a great supplement. And then Warlord said, okay, yeah, we'll run with it. But what we want you to do is, Donk, we want these uh, drone society in it. We want you to get rid of the guys you'd already done. The, some of the things you'd already done, we want you to do this and that and the other. But most of it was already there. So that was actually a fan production. It just wow. happened that I joined Warlord as it was published. Mm -hmm. um, Bromvar is a fan production as well, by Helen Burton mm -hmm. as the Raiders of Bromvar. What inspired them was this really rich background, not just the game itself. The D10's great, the, um, the interrupt system, the dice system is really, really great. Um, the number of different weapons are great, and the use of drones for me is really, really great. That's what makes it a great game. Uh, but the background is obviously something that really inspires me and a whole bunch of others. Um, you know, it's not a gothic, uh, grim, dark type horror. It's sort of vaguely hard space opera, I should say, rather than hard science fiction, um, because it's not hard science fiction. You've got you know people travelling through wormholes, and people, <laughs> and scientists are still debating now whether or not you can travel through a wormhole that isn't as you know that isn't the size of a galaxy without getting destroyed. That sort of stuff. So, so it's got some space magic in there. 
Um, but it's also that I think I liked the ethics, which is a bit odd, which behind each faction. Each faction has got a good side or a bad side, and it's got good points and bad points. Um, so, for example, the Concord. Yes, great. It's a post. The core Concord society is a post scarcity. You can do almost anything you like. Um, you know, if you want to go on, I think it was in one of Ian Banks's books, somebody decided to clean down tables in a restaurant for a living because he liked cleaning down tables and he liked meeting table and say, people and saying, excuse me, can I clean this table for you? Doing the best job he could and chatting to them as he did it, you know. Um, and of course, all of that could have been done automatically, but he liked it and he did it. So it's, I love that bit that Rick's actually included that in the game so We've not seen much of that, I think, in um, game backgrounds. Um, but the other side of the Concord is if it finds a new world, it wants to, the Concord Intel um, automatically decides that you really need to be part of the Intel because it's very good for you, isn't it? <laughs> yes, which some people find horribly sinister. They, they see that as something, something like the Borg, whereas obviously mm -hmm. those people who are in the Concord are saying, well, actually, no, it's a post-scarcity society. I can do almost anything I like, which is a bit like um, Ian M. Banks. I like player of games, where you've got somebody who plays games as his job, and he just happens to live on this orbital, and he's really, really good. Gergay, I think, is, and um, he's that's what he does, and he's known for it, and he doesn't have to worry about anything at all. He doesn't even get an income. He's just got, you know, as I suppose, post scarcity. He's got a big house. He's got a few friends, and they come around, or maybe he, they don't because he's a bit private, but that's what I love about it. So you've got that twist. I even love uh, some of the imagery around Antares. I actually quite like the Concord um, strike troopers. I really love the guard battle suits. Really love the guard battle suits. I think they're great models, absolutely fantastic. I've, you can try almost any sort of thing you do. I have mine dancing or waving something <laughs> in the head, just <laughs> falling backwards. And uh, I actually even quite like the outcast. Poor, pathetic little creatures that they Oh, yeah. <laughs> little pot bellies. It, it's yeah. nice to see well, my body we, shape finally we, represented spinal in plugs. Games. Just awful, poor things. So it's, uh, <laughs> and again, I like the attitude, which was, you know, summed up in Rick's rule, which is, you know, we're, we're playing this game together for a bit of fun. We're not mm -hmm. trying to make, inflict some form of humiliating social defeat on somebody we're playing. <laughs> Um, and that's and that's something which I, I really connect with, um, which is quite good. We've we've talked about you adding to the lore and the actual game mechanics of Antares, uh, and and it's like you said, it, you know, it's very particular how you make sure everything fits like lore wise, like in the existing universe. But like, what is that step by step process when you want to add the mechanics of something new, be it a character or you know a new drone or a weapon or something like that? Yeah, well, the real thing is only make new stuff if you have to. So, as mm. I think I've said, there are loads of weapons and effects already. So, if something new comes up, try and fit it into all of that lot that we've already got. Otherwise, you cannot help but get rules crawl and power creep, and we've all seen that. And you, we've all seen how that has to be fixed and all the rest of it. And I just don't think that we ought to go down that step with Antares. We know it exists. Let's not do it, you know, if we can. So makes uh, sense. So that's that's the key thing. Is is but the other thing is to try and keep the new mechanics to a minimum uh, for exactly the same prosaic. I mentioned it with the Virai, um, but it's also with the Vol. The Vol have got some particularly unique things and I'm trying to pull them back into what we can construct and what we can do with it, uh, Antares 2. Uh, and whilst they've got some really, there's a really odd concept, fundamentally we're not going to put in any new mechanics into the game. They're going to use the existing mechanics, but they're just in a slightly different way. And that's the key thing. Can you use what you've got but in a slightly different way, which makes this faction unique? And it makes sense, and I appreciate that, because it's also just a really way of auto-balancing, you know, and it's also, mm -hmm. yeah. it's easy to translate for players, because if, if, if the plasma carbine or plasma rifle is the epitome of technology, when you see that a unit is armed with a plasma carbine, you can just, in your own mind, organically be yeah. like, oh, well, that's probably an elite trooper, or something yeah. along those lines, and it, and it also helps to just understand the tactical capabilities of thing at a glance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So don't overdo it. I mean, it's a compression car one. People know that 
compression carbines are fairly rare. Why are they rare? Because they've got this awkward thing of having different um, strike values of different ranges. Uh, they're not, it's already had the background, perhaps they're not as um, easily field maintainable as, say, uh, a mag repeater, that sort of stuff. So when you see an Ascar unit armed with them, you know that they are actually actually elite mercenaries exactly and they are well well supplied well maintained and the freeborn are going to um make sure that that unit uh brings in a lot of money <laughs> frankly or resources rather because they don't necessarily deal in money but they will deal with all sorts of other things like resources like oh yes uh, just build us four more starships please or they'll be issued with some form of trade credit which they can then use with other people in the concord if you see what i mean Mm -hmm. um, Oddly enough, the Ashkar only deal in fish barrels, just barrels of fish. Just That's barrels of fish. Yep. Yep. <laughs> they thousand, got a taste for it. Four thousand <laughs> barrels of proto shark, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think that would probably offend uh, the scarf, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, it's it comes back to immersion and really knowing the rules and matching the existing law. So. Uh, you don't get any role plays. You don't generate role blocks. Um, uh, as you said, it's there already. It's balanced already. Let's try and not dream something up and leveraging mm -hmm. it in. Mm -hmm. Just look at the ideas, twist the ideas, ask if it's Antares, and then make it. I mean, as I said before, ideas really are ten a penny. You can have loads of ideas. Anybody can have loads and loads of ideas. But it's actually having filtering out the ones that are sensible and implementing implementable sorry that's probably a not a word but there we go uh, that maps the background so we've talked about a lot of the, the characters that you've you've created for beyond the gates of Antares, uh and you've written a, a, a ton of awesome characters in your fiction uh are we going to see more characters from if you're allowed to talk about this are we going to see more characters from your fiction make their way into version two and are we going to see uh updated rule sets for the characters that are already in version one uh, yes, highly likely we'll see more characters and we'll almost certainly, we've already discussed it, we'll almost certainly give um, new profiles for the characters. Uh, we've got people like Batu will pro probably be retired because he's run his course, he's feared by the intel and there's, you know, we can't really do much else with him. Um, and that's fine. You know, it's great to retire a character who's reached their potential who, or who's reached the end of his story. Um what is how the only story you could really do which would be interesting would be getting rid of the shamasai dust of some way which will probably involve killing Vato outright which is not something i really want to write about um <laughs> but but if we go into version two we cer certainly will get get uh, more stories so i'd like to do a few more on taras calamon perhaps jagaleos uh and the hook I think have got real potential for a whole load yeah. of stories. Mm. So we'll see. Um, I'll almost certainly write a few Algorin pieces to give players some idea or better idea of how their culture operates at the lowest level. So rather than focusing at the Taurus, Jinnar and the Esmarak, you're actually dealing with the gritty soldier. What's he, uh, what's he normally referred to? He's normally referred to as uh, Blick 5. Why Blick 5? Well, because that's his squad number. You know, yep. <laughs> what's his real name he hasn't got a real name what do you mean he's big five you know not quite as bad as star wars 7029 will you report you know we've got a yeah, yeah. It's, it's a case of yeah his name's sarik really but uh everybody known as blick five and then when he changes squats he's known as uh uh on three or something whatever it is so it's uh so it's trying to get that across and trying to show people how that's sort of like society is set up, which would enable more fan writing, I think. Um, obviously, everybody yeah. knows about the story, about the potential for an algorithm civil war which, between Taras Janar and Esmarak, or at least those are the figureheads. It's actually Esmarak who's the leader of the um, SD and the conservatives, if you like, and Taras Janar, who is going to become, or it looks like he's been raised up as the figurehead for the progressives. And I love the the twist there, which is actually the progressives in uh, algorithm society are actually those who want to remain algorithm and not use all the new technology. But they're happy. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, they're happy with talking to people. If it ain't broke, people. don't fix it. Yes. Whereas Esmeralda is 
all about yes it's algorithm but against everybody else everybody else is up against us but let's use all this new technology and of course <laughs> you know and that's that makes her anathema to many of the more lowercase conservative algorithm who are in the progressive party and i love that twist i love that <laughs> that's uh, great uh, that contrast is, is mm-hmm. really really great can't talk about much more i think on version that's two. quite all right uh, <laughs> uh, tell us on. your secrets tim <laughs> when without revealing too much obviously because we know you can't say too too much uh what was like the overarching like concept of like what because like you said, the system is very, you know, I think it's very clean cut. It's very balanced. What was it that was, you know, what you folks wanted to change? It's... It... Um, I'm trying to twist that round, uh, twist that round. We didn't want to actually change much at all. Oh, okay. Is the actual answer mm-hmm. to that. So which is why it's a bit of a struggle to answer. Uh, basically, we had a low, whole load of feedback from version one, obviously just been out quite a while now. And for version two, basically we wanted just to match the players' feedback. We wanted to do, give the players what they wanted and produce a version two based on the feedback they'd given uh, and sort out any main issues which they've raised because there was, um, there was a whole load of stuff, obviously, which was feedback on forums or through emails or from stuff which came over on the facts and stuff which came over into the rules amendment and the errata. Um, and it's a case of putting all of that lot together uh, and then pulling, pulling in some issues which we've found and also pulling in the requirements of the retailers and using all of that to streamline streamline. Uh, the game because A2 is if you play the A1 A2 is you know almost identical you can carry everything over you know it's plasma carbine instead of plasma carbine it still does the same thing there's a few bits here and there which are different um, but overall it, it's it's been just streamlining and doing what players want it's getting rid of all the faff and the silly things and the um, you know if you roll high it's good here if you roll low it's good there it, no it, everything's just if you roll low, it's good, you know. Um, no, you don't have to keep having multiple different checks of multiple different results and different types of terrain. Mm-hmm. So it's it's basically streamlining, which is what players really wanted every time we asked and every uh, event we asked. That's what players said. Um, there are a few things which are different. Rick had an idea with criticals that's worked out really well. Streamlined that like nobody's business. Nice. And we tried a bunch of ideas to sort out overhead um, which are now sorted out and that's great because overhead was becoming too powerful um, I remember trying out one game where I had a um, a mod 3 mag mortar mounted on a vehicle oh, and <laughs> that's I a just, nightmare I was just, <laughs> it was just awful my my opponent was in tears at the end I think. <laughs> well it, it would have been ground to it, dust and, yes uh, mm. And he, it was in the first couple of turns. It was, it's, it's, you know, six loads of shots from a magmata who was doing spotting through a remote spotter drone. Yeah. And we want to fix that sort of like overkill, which wasn't, hadn't able, really been able to be explored in, in the game. So, yep, and so that's what we fixed. Um, we worked out, uh, our terrain's been really cleaned up. We worked with um, a friend of mine who is, is in the military. And he was talking about nice. terrain and cover and progressive terrain. That's now really quite simple. Mm. Um, the other inputs were actually to do with retailers and sales teams, which is to say, look, we needs we need to be able to see the flavour of each faction much easier. Anybody who's played Antares knows that you cannot run Boromites in the same way that you run uh, Concord. You will lose every time yeah. because Concord oh, yeah. are a ranged <laughs> army. Boromites are a uh, a close in let's get tough let, let's get physical army and if you try and write, run one that way uh, the the other one preferred you just can't do it even the Krats, which is who are actually really tough individuals they are still if you like the concord's concept of a close in fighter rather than the really really tough close in fighters 
which say a, uh, a a boromite lava mite squad actually is yeah you know, when it when it mm-hmm. tears you apart that sort of thing so what we want to do though is heighten that um so we've had to change the lists to enable that and we've had to what we've done is eased up on the current current constraints because one of the criticisms was a lot of the lists especially at the low level ending up producing identical armies all the time so you end up facing so many squads of this so many squads of that and a few other things so we've eased back on that so whilst there's still a core which you have to take for each army and that's what forms the core of the army that's far more representative say of the british army consisting of you know a challenger tank plus a few scimitars plus some infantry around the place plus an apache helicopter um rather than saying you've got to take 16 of this or mm. um, you your choices are so limited that you can only take these mm. um, so so that's something we've done and it's something that seems to have worked really really well i'm really chuffed about how that's come out uh, and hopefully what we'll do, end up doing is that it will mean we can produce some army boxes which will be effectively a ready-made army from the go and just say bonk let's take that and you can use it it just fits on the table or it can actually be the core of the next size army up. So that's um, really cool. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, it will save players money as well. So yep. yeah, you know, I'm 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 really chuffed with what's come out of there. So so moving on to a, a little bit less of a, uh, a theory intensive question, uh, taking off your creator hat and stepping back into the role of a fan. Uh, what is your favorite faction to play on the field, and your favorite factions to write and read about? Well, I have to confess, it's probably Gar, um, as they are (laughs) such a lost hope. They are such a tragic, tragic nation, Um, you know. But I actually do really quite like the Concord and Freeborn, and I think I've got more Concord and Freeborn than anybody else. Um, Obviously, I I have some stuff from Warlord from the position I'm in, and I loan it out a lot. Mm. But I've still got, I I loved the Damari. Uh, and the fact that basically they're just a militia effectively someone's yeah. gone through a starship mm-hmm. and said Oi, <laughs> I need you, you, you and you Oi, I saw you disappear out that, out that hatch <laughs> come back up here you know? <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah you are going to have the uh, you're going to have a micro X launcher and the guy just says okay <laughs> the rest of you grab some <laughs> yeah, so I love that militia element of them but then we've also got this core of the Vardenari guard and I love the fact that um, you've got this uh, this command troop who basically, obviously, is the richest person on the ship because they've got everything you know, they could possibly <laughs> have. Yes, it's an expensive unit, but I do love running a souped-up command unit and sending that out. It does attract a lot of firepower because people oh, yeah. just see what it's got and think, <laughs> ah! But it's just so much... It, you know, the freeborn clone is so much fun. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. but Gar Gar are just just great. Just the battle suits and the outcasts. Never mind mm-hmm. about anybody else in it. They're just really lovely. Um, and I think it's, it's I love writing that Batu, the the first Batu Shaltok storyline as well. Um, because of that, uh, I think probably, um, and that's the other reason why I like Freeborn's course because they lend themselves to being such fantastic scoundrels and opportunists. Mm-hmm. Um, I think from writing, um, I'd struggle really. I think everybody struggles with the Mtel nations. Um, mm. I think David Horribin managed it with his civilian story, which is really quite good in Open Signal. And Adam Merton managed it, I think, with his Vioskion story on the Nexus. That was really quite nice. I really love that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's probably easy because of there's so much control and tightness and the intel trying to anticipate your every move it's probably easier to write about the intel nations and the viri as well i guess from the outside um mm. as i did with Gigaleus. so it was very much an outsider's touching and you're just touching lightly on the concord rather than being embedded in but for me that's a signal that actually i really ought to write a concord story of some kind, um, pick up a few characters and actually have them do some stuff just so that I can actually do it and make sure that it's um, a, achievable in, in a reasonable <laughs> way, if you see what I mean. Okay, Tim, we have found ourselves at the last question. <laughs> we appreciate you coming. <laughs> this is great. We could probably go on for hours. 
Uh, and we're going to ask this to every single person that we interview in the future. So you're the first, so no pressure, okay? <laughs> but what are you excited for in the future of wargaming in general? And what would you hope will never change about the hobby? Okay, well, the, the last thing is probably the easiest, um, which is fundamentally um, the camaraderie, the fun element of it, the, the narrative element of it. Um, even bits like make your own terrain and that sort of thing, um, and for Antares, make up your own units and armies and backgrounds. Um, but it's also the support from the people you get from the table. I've, I've picked up over the years some really good friends from Wargaming, and... Uh, and they've been probably the most supportive people I've known when I've come into some issues, which says a lot, um, given the various things I've been into in my background. Um, so that's one of the things I, I really love. You know, on the whole, Wargamers are, are quite caring people, I think. Um, and they are concerned uh, about things outside the table um, so that's great that's great uh, and as to the futures and that sort of stuff well I th think we could look at a bit of the past there to say we've really had the explosion in small small smaller companies small games companies RPG and war games companies because of the self-publishing software and all the rest of it that's come up and the marketplace like drive through RPG and war game folds and all the rest of RPG now etc and they've really really help that but what they've done in so doing is polarized it so you've got the bigger companies and you've then got these smaller companies uh, and I, I think what we'll see next and i think it's already underway is the is really based on the development of the good design software we've got at the moment and the gradual expansion production techniques you know war game uh, warlords and a few other people have got this soft resiny plastic thing which can be cast a bit like the metal, um, sort of. It's not quite that there, but it's um, it's a bit like that. Uh, and we're already seeing 3D printing coming on leaps and bounds. And whilst we've got .stl files and some really nice ones being available, uh, it's not for everyone for a whole load of reasons. Um, 3D printers can be quite finicky. They can be not as detailed as you could necessarily get to. You've got to have all the struts, supporting struts and everything else for all the figures and everything else. And so, gem so generally, some of us have to rely on the old, me mold older methods, the older production things. I happen to love hard plastics. It's quite forgiving and it doesn't bend or break or whatever. Well, if it does break, you can just stick it back on with some solvent or whatever. You know, it's easy. <laughs> um, and I love what people like War Games Atlantic are doing at the moment with producing loads of small, of um, small sprue hard plastics and i could probably do it and small sprues are cheaper than big sprues for example um fundamentally though i think this the development of the cad software will mean a, a tremendous change in the way the big companies approach stuff uh, you can already in the studio repose and re-equip models much quicker when you've got cad software you can just say i don't like that gun i'll swap it out put it in or I don't like that pose let's just change the arm position from here Neat. to there you know and I can see that we're doing that at the moment we're using the 3d printers for mastering um, so you've really got this massive amount of poses so will 3d printers become much cheaper and much detail quite likely and will it mean that what we'll be see the process is perhaps as someone in a studio having a designer set of software like that to say, here is your Concorde Trooper in his armor and all the rest of it. And then what you can do is say, repose that one yourself uh, so that you end up having a print on demand squad of models yeah. in all That'd the poses so cool. you particularly like with all the weapons you want. It may not be, it may not be here, you know, maybe 10 years down the line or something, five years down the line, but I can see that happening. It'd be really good. Um, Yes, I think the other techniques will stay and the, the other production techniques will stay uh, and will be a staple at the low end of the market, perhaps. It's relatively easy to cast resin. I've played with resin. 
So it has to be easy because I can do it. it you know, and the, <laughs> vac- the things like vacuum extractors are actually quite important um, for more serious than home home use uh, to get all the bubbles out and stuff. Uh, and actually, you can cast. I know people who cast um, metal bottles at home, hmm. um, and it. It's relatively forgiving. Oops, I made a problem with that. I'll melt that down. Um, yes, you've got to be careful about how you, how often you re- recast it because the metal can get a bit odd. Um, but nonetheless, it's something that will remain at the low end, I think, uh, for a long time. That would be very cool. If I could print my own miniatures at home, and it would be super easy. Be all <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> or, or, or even say, I want that one, that one, that one, that one printed. Yeah. Um, the squad, and just have them done and sent down to yeah. you mm-hmm. without going through all the picking that would be packing. even better mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i'm, I'm a very so accident prone person, person. No, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, i know no, i'm with you there um, <laughs> yeah it's printing and packaging and all the rest of it it's and the picking which can take a long time um especially for complex models like some of the antares ones where oh, left arm can look a lot like right arms you've got to look mm-hmm. really carefully to see this where's the Ah, oh, there's the thumb. You know, right, this, you know. um, or you're looking at a really weird uh, weapon, and you're thinking, "I'm not sure. Are these are these plasma coils? Are there are these you know compression coils? You know, it's it's specialist stuff. So to be able to just say, "I want that, that, that," and have the whole lot come off in one pack would actually help with picking and production side of stuff mm. as well. I can only imagine the orientation for that position is hilarious. It's like, now this is your normal, you know, musket, okay? <laughs> and right over here is your standard issue mag repeater, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. I can only imagine that you have life-size models of all of them. That, that And don't don't tell me you don't, because I want to continue imagining. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that brings this awesome interview to a close. Uh, We're going to have links to all of the stuff that Tim talked about below the video. We'll have links to some of his stories. Tim, is there anything specifically that uh, you want people to know about? Well, it's probably because I'm on this because of Antares. Uh, The Freeborn Shard, which is the podcast which has run through all the factions and through the supplements for version one. Uh, which is still running and will still be running for for a good year, I'd imagine at least, uh, if not more. Uh, that's on anchor.fm, and you can just go to anchor.fm and, and type in Freeborn Shard, and you'll get to it. It's called Freeborn Shard, obviously, because it wasn't from Warlord. It was started off as a fan, so we nothing to do with Warlord, if you see what I mean, though obviously I am now, which is a bit <laughs> odd. Um, and uh, Shard, obviously, because that's just a group in Antarian terms. Uh, and the other one, which is really important, I think, is that if anybody's interested in, in Antares at all, is to go to the Nexus, which is a knowledge base, and that's at www.gatesofantares.com. And that's got rules updates, it's got background, it's got facts, it's got our most up to date army list, because we provide the army list free of charge. Uh, so you can just download those, the most up to date ones. And it's got loads of images and examples of models, um, uh, game save reports, and obviously it's got links to the actual units on Warlord's games, on Warlord Games' own website, where you can actually see the stuff, buy it if you want. But actually, sometimes just looking at some of the painting is is lovely, and I think something all of us as uh, gamers really quite like. I think it's. Uh, it's one of the pleasures oh. of gaming is to look at such fantastic Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, there's the, some some paint jobs that just make me wish I was that person. Yeah. <laughs> <out there>. uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the Nexus is chocked full of awesome yeah. information. It's actually one of the, so when, when I first got into Beyond the Gates of Antares, I had discovered yeah. the Nexus, and literally yeah. it is just a treasure trove of information. Oh. So everybody definitely should check out the nexus definitely check out the freeborn shard it's a fantastic podcast and and we thank everybody for for joining us tim especially you our first guest for our under the tabletop segment this was under really the fun. under the tabletop <laughs> and uh, uh so when, when covid's done we're gonna build a blanket for it that's definitely oh, gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> but 
If you liked watching this, you should give this video a like. Thanks, if you guys. like this content, you should definitely subscribe to the channel. We would love to have you. And if you want to support us in the best possible way, you should consider joining our Patreon. Our Patreon uh, campaign and our patrons are the lifeblood of the, uh, the uh, channel. So we appreciate you once more, Tim. Thank you so much for coming out and talking to us today. It was such a blast. That was a pleasure, Kevin. But thanks, guys. And we will see you guys on the tabletop. <laughs> the mind fantastic. goes into too many dangerous places. <laughs> <laughs>